Hi, and welcome to this service of worship. My name is Megan Killingsworth. I'm one of the two pastors here at First United Methodist Church of Sanford, and I'm so glad that you have decided to join us for worship today. Before we get started, we have a few announcements to share. One, we just want to say thank you to Drew for all the hard work he did in putting together the art show, and we want to thank all of you who had a chance to check it out. Um, just know that we now own those prints, so if you didn't have a chance to walk through um, the art show and kind of see the work and reflections of Scott Erickson, we'll be making a permanent installation upstairs in the co-op. So there's a reason for you to head over to the co-op and look around and see what's changed recently, and also for you to check out um, the, the art show that's centered really on prayer and reflecting on the world around us. Uh, we also want to let you know that tonight is the beginning of our Making Sense of the Bible book study. So um, if you are still interested and you uh, want to jump in last minute, um, feel free to email me, megank at fumcsanford.org, and we will make some room for you to join us um, in that book study. We hope everyone's having a great Labor Day weekend, and we're so glad that you have joined us here in worship. Let us now have a moment to pause, to center ourselves, and to invite God to be near. Let us pray. Holy God, we turn now our hearts and our minds, our attention and our concern to you. Lord, as we carve out this time for worship, we pray that you would meet us here. Whatever it is that we came searching for, God, we ask and we seek and we knock and we search for you. And so, God, we invite you into this time and into our hearts. Help us to hear what you have for us today. And help us to be people who live in light of your word and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn this morning will be hymn 154. The good old hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We'll do all six verses.
We now invite you to take a moment and greet each other in the name and peace of Jesus. Uh, make a list of folks to call this week or write down some names that you're thinking about that you'll be praying for this week. Say hello on the Facebook chat. However it is that it looks like for you, take a moment and greet each other uh, as we gather again for this time and space of worship. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd. I want to invite the kids to come close now because this is a moment especially for you. In case we haven't told you recently, we want to be sure to always remind you that kids are so important in God's house. Jesus tells all sorts of stories about how important kids are, and so we want you to know that in worship and in everything that happens here at the church, that God loves you and that you are really important. So there once was this girl. She thought that what needed to happen was that we needed to clean up the riverbanks. She said there's garbage and there's plastic, there's waste and there's all sorts of ickiness that dead fish had washed up, it smelled bad, and that nobody had taken care of it. And so she gets this big idea that she thinks we need to clean up the riverbanks. And so she recruits people. Do you want to join my club? Do you want to come and be a part of this club? We are going to clean up the banks of the river, and we're going to help it to look much, much better. And so all these people get excited, and they're like, we definitely want to help you. And so she has one friend come, and then three more friends come, and four more friends come, and they have their first club meeting. And she says, okay, now, the fish are smelly. So we need somebody who's going to clean up all the dead fish. Who's going to do that? And they look around the room. And finally someone's like, okay, I'll do it. And then she's like, ooh, and there's so much garbage. There's so much garbage. So who has the nose and the stomach to be able to handle picking up all the garbage that's all around there? And no one wants to raise their hands. And so finally a friend raises their hand and says, okay, I'll be in charge of the garbage. And then the last thing she says is, now listen, it's muddy down there. It's nasty. Your feet are going to get dirty. Your shoes are going to get dirty. And we need somebody who's going to go and get muddy and plant some new plants along the riverbank. So who is willing to do that? And finally somebody raises their hand and says, okay, I'll go and get muddy. And then one of the other club members says to the girl who's leading, hey, so what are you going to do while all these other tasks are happening? And she says, ooh, that's gross. It stinks down there. I'm not going to the riverbanks. <laughs> now, obviously, none of us would join a club where the person who's in charge or the person who's supposed to be leading is unwilling to do the icky stuff. 
unwilling to do the stuff that they want to ask everybody else to do. Well, what's cool is that today we're hearing a story about Jesus. And what Jesus is doing is inviting all of the people who will hear this story, all the disciples and all of those of us who love Jesus. Jesus is inviting us to do really hard things. Things where our lives might get messy and things might be a little bit uncomfortable. But the cool thing about Jesus is that he's the sort of leader who doesn't ever ask us to do what he's unwilling to do. Jesus will clean up the stinky fish and the icky trash and the muddy water. That's the kind of Jesus that I follow, and that's the kind of leader that I love. And so, friends, as we hear the gospel story today, I want to invite you to know that that's the kind of God we serve. A God who loves us so much and who's willing to do all the difficult things that God asks us to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the kids who are part of our congregation and our community. We know that they have so much to teach all of us. Lord, we ask kids and adults alike that you would help us to be the sort of people and the sort of leaders that are willing to follow you, that are willing to get messy, that are willing to do the things that we might ask others to do. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Psalms. It's actually Psalm 23. Now, for lots of us, we will know these words. We might even be able to recite them. But I would invite us, as we hear these words, to pay attention. Pay attention to an image or a particular word or a particular phrase that sticks with us. And to think about that. What is it that God might be communicating to us? Hear now Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'll invite us now into a a posture of prayer. Uh, If you've got prayer requests that you want to submit, please email the front office or even mention them. on social media, if you feel like sharing them here in the feed. Uh, Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know who we can pray for and and what we can be holding in our hearts as a community of faith bound to and with one another. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the many blessings that we are so grateful to experience and and notice and walk with each day. Lord, we also know that there's great need and great hurt in our community and in our world. So Lord, we come to you as folks who carry both of those things at the same time. The blessing and the bruises. God, the the hurts and the hopes that are contained in each of our hearts. And so Lord, as we gather And share these prayers. 
be made known to us. Lord, we pray for those in need of healing, those who are recovering from procedures and operations, those awaiting diagnoses, those uncertain of the ailments that they're experiencing, looking for a way forward, a solution, an answer. And we pray for those families who've lost loved ones to COVID uh, and to other circumstances and other illnesses, those who are grieving. Lord, we pray for those who need healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those in need of wisdom and discernment. Whether that's about a job or uh, a next step, a new opportunity, or not knowing where to turn in the midst of uncertainty. We pray for those who need wisdom and discernment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those experiencing loneliness, those who are isolated and separated, cut off from those whom they love, those serving in the military, those who are incarcerated, those who are in the foster care system. God, we pray for those who are lonely, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our enemies. We pray for those uh, who hold different values than us, that hold different ideologies from us, those who stand against what we believe in. God, this is not easy work. But we believe that it's faithful work. Lord, help us to see our enemies as those who share our common humanity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we come to you with the great joys of our hearts, those things that lift us through heavy days, those things that give us hope. God, celebrations, birthdays, anniversaries, new life, new opportunities, places where we've seen healing and wholeness restored. God, we lift up these joys and celebrations to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, guide us. Walk with us. Lead us. As the psalmist has just reminded us, lead us to those green pastures, those calm fields in which we find peace and rest in you. Remind us that you are our good shepherd who walks with us on the mountaintops and in the valleys and everywhere in between. Hear these prayers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now continue our service of worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. As always, you can give online digitally through our website, fumcsanford.org slash giving. And many, so, so many of you have faithfully been giving uh, in, in, through the office and, and in other ways, getting creative. Um, let us now continue our giving back to God so many of the blessings that he's given to us. shepherd I have everything that I need he led 
God, we praise you. We praise you as the source of all life and all breath and all that we are. We praise you for all the things that we have. We praise you for the ways that you have loved us. God, we give to you a little bit of what you gave to us. We pray that you would not only make this practice an opportunity for us to give our gifts that could be multiply, multiplied and become a blessing for our community, but we pray that this practice would shape our attitudes towards our stuff. Help us to always be reminded that we are temporary stewards. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our next hymn is hymn 136, The Lord's My Shepherd. I will not want.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 21. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and they shall, there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there is a legend about a monk named Brother Leo. He was supposedly the wisest monk that ever lived, so lots of folks would try to travel to where Brother Leo was and learn from him, try to figure out, if you're so wise, how can I be more like you? And so there was a time when several monks took a pilgrimage to the place where Brother Leo lived because they wanted to learn from him. Now, starting out on the pilgrimage, almost immediately they began to argue over who should do certain chores and all the things that needed to be done on their journey. Not like any of the rest of us, right? On their journey, on the third day, they met another monk who was also going to the monastery, and so he joined their group. Now, this monk never bickered. He didn't whine about doing chores or doing whatever he needed to do dutifully. And when others would fight, he'd just take care of it. He would simply volunteer to do the stuff other people didn't want to do himself. And then on the last day of their journey, they arrive at this monastery. And some folks have finally begun to kind of emulate the example of this monk they found along the way. When, when they get to the monastery, they're really excited because they want to see this brother Leo. This group has pilgrimaged for days. The man who greeted them laughed. But our brother Leo is already among you. He pointed to the fellow that had joined them on their journey. It turns out that Brother Leo was the monk willing to take on all of the tasks that these travelers had been unwilling to do. That was his wisdom. As we think about the folks that we want to follow, as we think about what leadership looks like in this world, a lot of times what we hear from the world is that our best leaders are the ones that are up on a pedestal. The folks we travel far to learn from are the ones who have some sort of secrets and answers, and they are charismatic solo leaders. But what we learn from Jesus today 
But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I'm the shepherd that's willing to risk my own life for my sheep. I'm the shepherd willing to make sacrifices for the fold. I am the shepherd willing to lay down my life for the flock. Let's pray. Holy God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Because you're God, and we're not. Amen. Amen. So here we find ourselves again with a parable uh, with a lot of imagery. And here, once again, we have a parable about sheep. Uh, we talked about sheep a few weeks ago, and we hear a lot about sheep in this parable, a lot of different types of sheep. But one thing we do want to notice and we want to observe is that in this parable, there's lots of sheep, but there's only one shepherd. And that shepherd is Jesus. And what we also hear in the story is that the shepherd is the one that is the most bought in. The shepherd, unlike the hired hand, is the one that's there for the good times and the bad. The shepherd is the one that sticks around when the wolf and the lion come. He doesn't hit the ground running or gets, hits the road because the going gets tough. After all, these are his sheep. God, as the shepherd in this analogy, is totally committed. Here with us when it's beautiful and here when our lives feel like they're starting to crumble. So there's only one shepherd. And there's also only one flock. I don't know if you caught that. Jesus says, I am the one shepherd and there is one flock. And see, the shepherd is free to have whatever sheep he'd like. We don't get to decide to be a part of the flock. We can't even know who's a part of the flock. If you think about sheep, they can only see at a sheep's eye level. But the shepherd can see over all of them. He's got the perspective and the understanding of who is in this flock. And I think if we're honest, we can kind of think about this analogy as applying to the church. Unfortunately, the church has gotten pretty good about thinking they know and deciding who is in and who is out. Some of you may be familiar with what people are calling now cancel culture, where if you disagree with someone, you just write them off from your life. But friends, let me tell you, the church has been doing cancel culture long before it was cool or uncool. <laughs> with either, with either it's cool or it's cool, uncool, whatever way, the church yeah. has been doing it for a very, very long time. Some of you may remember a writer and a preacher named Rob Bell who wrote a book about God's expansive and immersive love and was basically written off mm -hmm. by a lot of Christians, a lot of his contemporaries. There was a prominent pastor a year or so ago who made headlines for telling Beth Moore, many of you know Beth Moore, an incredible biblical student and teacher and preacher, he said to Beth Moore, go home. Mm. And these two modern examples are unfortunately well in line with the church's long history of cancel culture, which they called excommunication for a long time. Copernicus, Joan of Arc, who was originally, uh, initially, or eventually brought back in, but she was excommunicated, and don't forget Martin Luther with the Protestant Reformation. So um, let's come back to earth, right? We, you may not have excommunicated anyone, or you may not be bought into cancel culture and believe that you should cancel anyone, but but maybe you snarl or even sigh when you hear about those Southern Baptists. Or maybe you, your guts churn a little bit when you hear about those crazily liberal Lutherans. Or the group that everyone loves to hate these days, the spiritual but not religious. What God is showing us in this parable is that there are ways that we can behave that are unchristian, even though we're in this flock. This passage is a reminder that God is the shepherd, God has the flock, and all of the rest of us are just sheep. Friends, we're glad to know the shepherd. There are sheep in the pen that you know, and there are sheep in the pen that you don't know. There are sheep in the pen, and there are sheep out of the pen. Our job is to be reminded and to, that we're not to be concerned with where the boundaries of the pen are or how secure the gate is. Our job is to be reminded, is to focus on the shepherd and to follow where the shepherd is leading us. 
Now, what we also notice from this passage is that Jesus is willing to lay down his life and to take it up again. I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus said, I, I am honored by God because I am willing to lay down my life and pick it up again, which sounds like, why do you have to do both, right? What is that about that Jesus is illustrating? Well, first we've got to hear that Jesus is the most invested, right? Jesus is not the sort of leader who kind of shows up and then vanishes. Jesus is the one who's saying up front, look, I lay down my life for these sheep. When the going gets tough, I am sticking around. I'm not a hired hand, right? I'm in it. And I'm in it when the wolves come, and I'm in it when the skies are blue. Now, what's cool is that Jesus is emphasizing, I am laying down my life freely for these sheep. You might be familiar with the Philippians 2 passage. It's often called the Christ hymn. And it sounds like, like this. Uh, in the Philippians letter, we are reminded that Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, instead emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant and putting on human flesh. Jesus is showing us, look, I am all the way in. I have chosen to lay down my life. I'm invested. We know that laying down his life really means surrendering, right? For us, laying down our lives means giving up control, giving up this sense that I get to be in charge, sacrificing what we might rather do, right? Jesus is engaging in this Look, I'm laying it all down for the sake of the sheep. Now, in, in biblical kind of history, if you look at the long history of um, biblical practice, early on in the Old Testament, there's a lot of talk about what biblical sacrifice is. Um, there were times when animal sacrifice was part of the religious practice, and there's a lot of talk about sacrifice all throughout Scripture. And so this image of biblical sacrifice is really about laying down on the altar what you previously had control over. That act of laying down, of surrendering our control over things like our lives and our money and our time. When we lay those down, we offer them knowing that they might be transformed on the altar outside of our control. They might be used. They are freed from being strictly in our grasp when we lay them down. Now, in animal sacrifice, even animals were not the, treated the way that we treat them now, right? Like, going to pick up an animal sacrifice as part of a religious practice was not hitting up Winn-Dixie on your way to the temple and, like, somebody already slaughtered the animal, right? Animal sacrifice meant that an animal that was part of your flock, an animal that was part of your raising that you had known since they were born, that animal was brought to the temple and was laid down an offering to God. That was a financial cost. That was an emotional cost. That was a long journey to make with this animal. That animal sacrifice, which eventually in Scripture we see changes into a different way of us understanding how we sacrifice for God... But that, that animal sacrifice was actually a practice that became food for the priests and sometimes even for the community. And I think this is really important for us to hear. That what comes to the altar as a goat leaves as a meal. Hmm. The feast that honored God in this sacrifice and the feast that fed the priests in the temple and the feast that sometimes was also shared with the community couldn't become a feast until it was first sacrificed and transformed. We hear that Jesus not only lays down his life like a sacrifice, but also picks it up again. Why? What's that about? Once you lay it down, why do you pick it up again? Well, what he's saying is, once it's been sacrificed, once I have laid down at the altar my money, my budget, my dreams, my life, my career, my will on the altar, once I have laid that down, I'm not in control of it and it can be transformed. 
And then I can pick it up again, and it can be used for God's kingdom. Jesus says, I freely lay down my life, that act of sacrifice, and then I pick it up again, transformed, lived out for the sake of God's kingdom. What we see is that Jesus is not asking us to do anything that Jesus won't first do himself. I am the good shepherd. I'm the one who gives it all. I'm the one who is more all in than anybody else. I'm the one who has laid down my life for this flock and who doesn't bolt when things get tough. I'm the one who has picked up again my cross, my call, my journey, my life, so that it could be a living sacrifice for the whole community and for the whole world. That is what Jesus does. That is how Jesus transforms the world. He's showing us that he is making a path that we are then invited to follow down. He isn't asking us to do something that he's unwilling to do himself, you see, because the life of this one good shepherd who can pick whatever sheep he wants, that life is inviting us to a life formed by Christ's way of living. Now, as we've covered the parables over the last eight weeks, what we've seen is that God has asked all sorts of perfectly insane things of us, y'all. God has asked us in all these parables for things that seem absolutely impossible, right? Forgiving someone who has wronged me 70 times 7, no thank you. Welcoming my enemies, absolutely not a thing that I am particularly excited about. Knowing that God's going to leave the 99 when I feel like I'm one of the 99 to go wander off and care for some other sheep, that, I, like, I get a little mad about that, right? Mm. These parables that Jesus has given us over these last eight weeks feel impossible. They feel like they're so costly. They feel like they're just uncomfortable and like it's just so big of a vision that God has created in creating a kingdom like this. And yet... I'm invited to follow in the footsteps of Jesus who does it first. Larry O'Donnell was the first CEO to be featured on uh, a TV show called Undercover Boss. Now, some of you may know the premise of the show, Undercover Boss. It's where a, a CEO or a president or leader of a company uh, is disguised and goes to work in the company that they oversee. And frankly, I'm really glad we've finally gotten to talk about Undercover Boss <laughs> as a showing because it now serves a purpose other than to make me sob uncontrollably whenever mm -hmm. I watch an episode. Because often the CEO is shown how their workers are struggling, shown uh, with some of the stuff that they're going through, shown how hard it can be to live out the policies and procedures that they've enacted. It builds empathy and it builds better leaders and it's a really powerful show. Powerful show for any CEO to, to kind of understand the plight of their workers. But for Larry, it was particularly powerful because Larry is, or was at the, that time, was the CEO of Waste Management. So Larry's week of shadowing his employees included cleaning out porta-potties and going on a garbage truck run and doing all of the jobs that no one would really want to do. And Larry throughout that week got an understanding of what it was like to be a waste management employee. The show can be often quite emotional, but its example it shows us what we know to be true in this parable as well. That the boss you can follow is one that you won't ask you to do anything that they're not willing to do themselves. Jesus is that for us, friends. Jesus is willing to do the work, willing to put in the risk and the sacrifice, willing to put his life on the line for those whom he cares for. These parables that Jesus shows us are models of ways to live, as Megan has reminded us. And all of the things that he does, he shows us how to live. Jesus comes to us in our humanity to model what it's like to live this life of grace and love and forgiveness and radical gospel living. And then Jesus invites us to follow him. So friends, that is our invitation this week. To be good sheep and to follow in the footsteps of our loving, 
and good shepherd. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn 381, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Friends, we've been reminded that we follow a good shepherd, a shepherd that leads us to still waters, that walks with us in life's dark valleys, a shepherd that walks with us and prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. So friends, on those days that we feel lost and not knowing where to go, let us turn to our example, turn to our shepherd and follow in those footsteps. And friends, may we go forth from this day sharing the love of God to the world, that to those who are lost, to those that are seeking their way, to those to whom love is a stranger might find in us generous friends. And friends, now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and guide you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>